going to talk about triaging common knee problems. And again, normally this is a longer talk. And what I'm going to try and at least have you walk away with tonight are a couple little like pearls and a couple things will be very obvious that are sort of my my shtick that I want you to sort of walk away and, and have when you when you see a knee injury or you're treating a knee injury or um, even thinking about a knee injury. A lot of times we think about this disasters and we talked about cervical spine disasters tonight and catastrophic things, but actually even with a bad ski wipeout, even with the worst thing, most knee injuries really aren't horrible. And despite Dr. Garrick's doom and gloom talk, actually a lot of people do really well uh, with their knee injuries down the road. I have many patients for decades long to, to prove it, um, and many of them do not do, need surgery, that's true, and very few of them are actually emergencies. It is important, though, always to try and go for the correct diagnosis. Um, time and time again, we, you know, especially coming from the emergency room to us, all the knee injuries are treated the same. And if there's one thing I can have you walk away with is don't treat all these things the same. Most of the diagnoses can actually be done based on the history of what, how the patient injured themselves. Um, the images are all great and they help to validate what we're thinking. But almost always when I see a patient, I talk to them for the first 10 or 15 minutes, I almost know for sure what the problem is before I've gotten, gotten an x-ray, gotten an MRI, or even touched them. So usually I know that. Okay, if you walk away with one thing tonight, just one, avoid the temptation to immobilize the knee, okay? That treatment is often worse than the original problem that the patient came in for. The emergency room loves the knee immobilizer. Okay, the knee immobilizer is not the knee's friend. And oftentimes, the patient gets seen, they get put in a knee immobilizer, whether it's up in the mountains or in the emergency room, and then they can't get their follow-up appointment for maybe a week or 10 days or two weeks, or they sort of forget about it. And then by the time they come in, they have all this stiffness, and that stiffness and weakness that come from that immobilization are oftentimes worse than whatever the real problem was that started it off. So the knee immobilizer should not be your go-to thing when you see a knee injury, even no matter how scary and how bad it looks, the patient's not going to be paralyzed, and there's really only one or two diagnoses that really need a knee immobilizer, so we'll get to those. Okay, so when you see an acutely injured knee, there are certain things you sort of want to kind of run through your head. Obviously, there's the meniscal tear, there are collateral ligament tears, there can be a contusion, a cruciate ligament tear, or an extensor mechanism injury. Okay, it is just the extensor mechanism injury that will require that knee immobilizer. So all these other things don't need it. Just this little one down at the bottom, and that can come from a variety of flavors, and we'll talk about these later. But this happens a lot less than all of these, a lot, lot less. So that's why you really don't want that to be your go-to thing. Key history trips. Was there a twisting injury? Was there a fall? Did they hear a pop? Really important, how quickly did the knee swell up? Was it right away? Or was it, you know, the next 12 to 24 hours? Were they able to continue their activity or was that it? They were done for the day. Also, are they able to straighten or bend their leg or does it kind of lock or catch? Does, how much does it swell? Does it swell a little bit? Does it swell a lot? Can they do a straight leg raise? That's a really important thing we'll talk about. And can they even walk? Okay, we'll start with meniscal tears. Meniscal tears can be degenerative or they can be acute. And they are way more typically degenerative than acute. Medial one gets hurt much more than the lateral one. That's just something to keep in mind when you're seeing these injuries. Here we are looking at a meniscus there. They tend to happen, if it's acute, from a twisting injury or a rapid slowdown. You know, if you're playing tennis and you do a sudden cut side to side, something like that can cause it. But honestly, more typically, it just sort of starts to happen over time. People start to talk about the fact that, you know, their knee's starting to hurt more, it's starting to swell more. It's starting to catch a little bit. They'll be walking along. They feel like something's stuck in their knee and they have to jiggle it loose. That's the classic history. That's not. Um, swelling rarely occurs immediately. So this is a really key point. Even, if, it do, even if, it's, if it's an acute meniscal tear from that football game or what have you, they don't tend to swell up right away. They'll say, oh, you know, I hurt my knee. I really, it's painful. It kind of hurts a little bit to walk, but I can walk. Well, when did it start swelling? Well, you know, I heard it around 2, maybe about 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night. It felt a little funny, but the next morning it was swollen. That's the typical history, even of an acute meniscal tear. Oftentimes, they'll try to continue their activity. They may or may not be able to, but it's not necessarily game ending, play ending. They may continue to try. They may even ski the rest of the day. And again, the swelling is later. 
these people will hurt when they squat. They will be able, no longer be able to skit, sit um, crisscross applesauce Indian style. They have trouble doing their yoga class because they can't get into those deep squat positions. But they're ex experiencing that catching and locking experience. Again, that feeling something's not quite in the right place. Think meniscal tear. They may feel a quote unquote giving way or a little bit of instability, especially if it's a medial meniscus tear because it does have a stabilizing role in the knee. It's considered the secondary stabilizer to the ACL. So they may describe some instability, but it's not the first thing they're talking about. When you examine them, they will have an effusion. They'll have a swollen knee. They'll have pain along the joint line. Here's another key point. The pain will be in one spot. Meniscal tear people will talk about pain right here. One spot, one fingertip. And that also is a generally good, pardon the pun, rule of thumb. Um, as far as injuries, if something hurts in one spot, and it's repeatedly in the same spot, one fingertip, it's more ominous, a little more worrisome than something that hurts like here, you know, like all over here. If someone points to kind of a general region, it's probably less worrisome in the knee than pain in one spot. And oftentimes they'll have a decreased range of motion, and especially they'll have a trouble sometimes kind of going from bent to straight. Not all tears require surgery. Um, sometimes if they actually don't have that locking catching and if they aren't having swelling, if it's a small enough tear, you can kind of sit on it for a while. Um, it, it sort of is like a dog lying down and playing dead. Sometimes it'll rear its head again and you have to do something. It's certainly not an emergency and nothing that has to be done right away. Um, obviously, you'll start with anti-inflammatories, rest, ice. Um, the things that might lead you to surgery are decreased motion in those locking and catching episodes, or even if it's just swollen a lot of the time because then it's causing trouble in the knee. But again, it's not an emergency. <coughs> Collateral ligament injuries. And here again, we talk about the press. The ACL, the anterior cruciate ligament, which we'll talk about in a minute, has a great agent, okay? You would think that every ligament injury in the knee is the ACL because you read about it in the paper all the time. It's what you hear about. You don't hear about collateral ligament injuries all the time, even though the MCL is the number one ligament injury in the knee, bar, by not, bar none. And yet, it's not a big deal, and probably because it doesn't need surgery, and it's, it's really nothing you have to worry too much about. The medial collateral ligament is injured the most in the knee, and it's injured more than the lateral collateral, and it's the only ligament that will heal itself. So actually, it's the good ligament to injure because it will do itself on its own. Um, it really rarely requires surgery. Sometimes, if there are multiple ligaments injured in the knee and you're, you're doing other ligament surgery anyway, you might do it. But if it's an isolated MCL tear, I really, you're not going to need to have surgery on that. Typical, it's after falling down or falling down some stairs or a lateral impact. It's really common with skiers, super common. And this is the classic one. Some, someone's up skiing, they fall and hurt their knee. Then they go in, they see the folks at the clinic at the bottom of the mountain, knee immobilizer. Then they have to get back down from the mountain or take their flight home or whatever, and then they finally get in to see you, and now their knee is really stiff, and they didn't need this. So again, avoid that knee immobilizer. Okay, here's one where the tenderness is along a diffuse area. It's not just um, in one area in the knee. It's this whole area. Meniscal pain would be right one spot, right there. This is pain all along the ligament and it's diffuse. There won't be a big swollen knee. The knee itself isn't swollen. The swelling is going to be along this region here because it's outside the knee. The MCL isn't actually in the joint. It's outside. Again, you can do anti-inflammatories, icing. You know, some people will brace it, not an immobilizer, but a hinged brace, but oftentimes that's not even necessary. It really just needs time, often some physical therapy, just to help avoid getting weak associated with that and getting people the confidence to go back and be able to use it some more. This is the hinged brace, again, not the knee immobilizer, but the hinged brace that you can use. And if I do put this on people, it's mainly for pain control. And you set it so that they have full range of motion, so you don't lock it in full extension, but you allow them to bend it. But some people find that these hinges are actually, give them a protective sensation and it's comfortable, but at most for three to four weeks, and you have them still take it off, get on a stationary bike, things like that. Knee contusion, it's kind of obvious. It happens after a fall. Swelling is common. The pain here is diffuse. And the main reason I mention this is to make sure you don't confuse this with a patella fracture or a, a rupture of a quad tendon or a patella tendon. 
And again, activity modification crutches only if they need it for pain control and anti-inflammatory ice, it'll get better on its own. An osteochondral injury also happens with a fall, um, and oftentimes people hear a crack. Um, and then they also can have, and here's someone with one, I've got this large osteochondral lesion, you can see some of it floating out here. Um, they often will have the locking symptoms too, but it's more diffuse. They don't have that specific joint line pain. Their pain is sort of all over the knee, and they'll, they'll have the catching symptoms as well. Sometimes you have to operate on them, especially if it's displaced, like that last one, and uh, other times, if it's not completely displaced, it'll just sort of heal on its own. Okay, here we go, the ACL injury that you hear so much about all the time. It typically occurs um, in lots of sports. With skiers, you especially see it, uh, bless you, in the intermediate skier some, and the beginner skier. And the classic thing with these is everybody, when they go to rent skis, and you see this a lot more with people who rent skis than people who have their own skis, because when you rent skis, you have to fill out what type of ski are you, type one, type two, or type three, right? And everybody always overestimates the type of skier they are. No one wants to admit they're a type one. And if you're a type two, you're going to say you're a type three because it looks cooler to the guy setting your skis, right? <laughs> well, what that means is then they're setting your bindings tighter. So every level you go up as a, as a type skier, level skier, is how tight they tighten your bindings. And so if you tell them you're a level three skier, and, they, and, they, and you're really a level two, or even if you are a level three skier, and they set your bindings really tight, when you fall, it's less likely to release, and you're more likely to get an ACL tear. So I suggest to you, if you're renting skis, you tell them you're a level two skier, even if you're like the best skier on the planet, because it's better to have the ski come off than to tear your ACL. Um, we know that there's an elevated risk um, in women. We don't know why. There are all these different theories about center of gravity. There was a theory for a while that had to do with time, period, um, time of the month in your menstrual cycle, and that's been disproven. But there was a big, expensive study done in Colorado on that to see if, it, if there's any correlation. That was a good gig for a fellow somewhere <laughs> doing that. Um, and it's, um, it's much less common than the press would suggest. You know, you pick up the newspaper every single day, there's an ACL tear getting some operation somewhere. Someone even, this is great, I love this, someone did a whole thing on the, the mechanics of the fall with an ACL, and how but if you fall and your ski doesn't release, it's going to cause a problem. Um, it can obviously occur in other sports, often with rapid deceleration or coming down from a jump. The main thing with this is, and these are the two real key things, aside from hearing a pop, because you can also hear a pop if you tear your MCL, people know this happens. It's, you know, they say, I hurt my knee on January 2nd at 3.52 in the afternoon. I was done. I was you know, playing soccer, skiing down the hill, and I was done. And their knee swells up right away. It doesn't happen in 6 to 12 to 24 hours. Within an hour, their knee is very swollen, oftentimes within 15 minutes. It's not subtle. Um, when you're examining them, obviously they're, they're usually very guarded, but they will be loose. Um, what's interesting is usually within 24, 48, definitely by 72 hours, a lot of the pain is gone um, because once you've torn the ligament, damage is done. You can have some bruising of the bone and the cartilage that can cause some lingering pain. But if you didn't also tear your meniscus, usually you just have the discomfort from the swelling, and they don't nearly have the pain that you'd see with, say, a meniscal tear or an osteochondral fragment or something like that. Again, this is not an emergency, even though it seems so exciting. You don't want to operate on these right away. You want to make sure they get the swelling down and their motion back. So that knee immobilizer is a really bad thing for these people. If you stick them in the immobilizer, they're going to get stiffer. So I you know, get them all moving it, you know, icing it, get, get them on a stationary bike, just spinning. Um, eventually, you can do the surgery, but make sure they're strong going in, because the number one determinant of how strong they are coming out is how strong they are going in. And same with motion. How much motion you have going in determines how much motion you have coming out. So um, there are a lot of reconstructions available. I'm not going to go into all of it, but um, mainly the main thing is to find someone who's you know, doing lots of these and quick recovery times. The rehab is going to depend on the surgeon. As a number of, the number of surgeons you have in this room will all have a different type of rehab that they like to do. But the most important thing is to be strong and important with that rehab to strengthen the other side as well. Because actually, your biggest predictor of tearing an ACL is having had torn your other ACL. So if you've torn one, you have a high likelihood <coughs> of tearing the other. So make sure you do the rehab on both sides. 
Okay, this is the one injury where you can actually use the knee immobilizer. And you just have to think about it. Because if you miss it, this is a catastrophic issue for these people. And I think that's why the ER docs put an immobilizer on everyone. But it's actually very easy to figure out. So the way you can injure your extensor mechanism, and what that extensor mechanism just means how you can straighten your leg, right? What you use to extend the leg. And so that can happen on a couple different places in your body. It can happen if you tear your quad tendon. It can happen if you break your patella, kneecap, or if you rupture your patella tendon. So those are the three things you can do that will mess this up. It can be associated with jumping. Occasionally, you'll hear a pop. They'll have diffuse swelling. But these are the people it's hard to walk because now they can't swing their leg through because they, they've lost that ability. And, and you'll see this over and over again, how it is hard to walk. And often, it'll happen with a fall on their knee. The main thing is to check and see if someone can do a straight leg raise. So all you have to do is you put your hand over their foot while they're lying flat on a table and say, can you touch my hand? Just have them do a straight leg raise. If they can do that, they did not injure one of these things, and you don't need a knee immobilizer. If they can't do that, or the foot tends to sort of fall, kind of hang down towards the table, then you have to think about it. And then probably you could use the knee immobilizer. <laughs> look for tenderness over the patella, and look for that extensor lag. And there, of course, is a patella fracture. And you can see why they can't straighten their leg out, because they don't have that connection. But the same would be true if they'd ruptured here, or if they'd ruptured down here. And again, this is the only time I really think you need that immobilizer. There it is. Don't look at it too long. <laughs> OK. So these people are going to need surgery. You just, this is one thing where you just can't avoid it, because you want to reconnect that whole link up. So they're going to need surgery. But again, it's not that night. It can be done you know, in the next several days. So putting it all together, the history, the physical examination, and the treatment, avoid the knee immobilizer. And you fewer emergencies, and again, you, you don't need the immobilizer. And that's it. So <laughs> there you go.